And so we are recording now. And good morning, everybody that's joining in. We've got a big crowd that's coming in today. So we've got another 70 or so more yet to shine, shine their faces. So anyway, <laughs> good to see you. Thanks for, for, for joining us. You're going to really be glad that you made time for today. Uh, I'm your host, RJ Kelly. Um, I'm, I'm at home in my home studio. Uh, so, and because of that, <laughs> we're going to get possibly the, uh, today's recycling day and the trash pickup day. So I'm <laughs> Uh, this thing with the filter to try and keep most of that noise out. But, and as I was uh, in encouraging Art to take off his jacket, he looked so handsome with it on, but he, he looks much more comfortable with it off. Yep, I sure do. Yep. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about it this morning as I was, you know, putting on my nice dress shirt, but um, hey, I'm in shorts. You know, I, I don't know about the rest of you guys. I'm, I'm in shorts. Uh, I, got my, uh, I got my sandals on and um, so... I hope everybody's comfy in front of their uh, <laughs> Jerry, oh, yeah, I heard the term business mullet. Business mullet. Okay. Um, yeah. I call them lockdown <laughs> locks. I am so overdue for a haircut. Uh, I know yeah. you just cut your hair for you there. <laughs> yeah. Lockdown locks. It's, it's coming. We're going to be able to, to, in fact, I read, I, I just uh, read about a woman yesterday in, in Hollywood that drove to Arizona like three and a half hours she drove there to go get her haircut she goes hey i got nothing else empty one so you know, it's like okay but i think they are going to be dr nick will be letting us know more about that in a few minutes uh but we'll be able to uh get rid of our lockdown locks okay well what else while well, folks are coming in hi julie and rick and John, uh, it's great to see everybody, and Dean and Cole. Oh my goodness, this is this is great. Jerry, again, hello. <laughs> um, Lynn, got that lovely Chicago Midwest look here. Good to see you. Yay. Um, and we were talking about uh, art has a wonderful collection up over you can see over his shoulder of some beautiful instruments that he also, if you pay him enough money, will play. Yeah. But he has a beautiful black a Gibson right over his shoulder there. So as I see Taylor Gibson on the call, I was like, oh, wow, this is an yeah. advertisement for Gibson. Um, that Talk about meeting both sides of it, because Taylor guitars are made right here in San Diego and El Cajon. Beautiful, right. incredible yep. instruments. And in fact, we're going to, I'm, I'm still chasing Bob uh, Taylor to, to have him for one of our leadership insight forms um, when he's in the country and not finding wood in other parts of the world. But what a great combination, Taylor Gibson. That really covers both sides of it. It <laughs> does, yep, yep. Okay. Well, let's do this. I'm going to just reward the people that are here on time. And, like, and by the way, again, I, sure, I don't know if I said hi to you yet, but anyway, good to see my, my buddy there and Timmy and Phil Ferrari up there, one of the, the most amazing videographers <laughs> we'll ever meet and photojournalist. Thank you for, for being a great friend and joining us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, I'm R.J. Kelly. Again, I'm founder and chief visionary officer of the Wealth Legacy Group and Wealth Legacy Family Companies. I also happen to be the co-founder and uh, chief executive for a nonprofit called the Center for Wealth and Legacy, and that is who is sponsoring our event today. Um, this is not my daytime gig. This is not what I do for a living, to put food on the table. <laughs> so if I stumble over my words, if I have dribble on my face, you know, please forgive me. Um, what I get to do is, though, in the course of my work, and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a son of an entrepreneur, and I have always been fascinated by the stories of great entrepreneurs and what they're doing to make a, a lasting positive impact in their world. And today, you're not going to get just from one, you're going to get two, uh, because I, I consider Dr. Nick to be an amazing entrepreneur. Yes, he is the chief medical officer for San Diego County. Uh, but he is an entrepreneur at heart, and if any time you spend with him, you'll figure that out. I've been a huge raving fan of Art Barter's uh, from Daytron since long before I even met him, because I heard so many things about this incredible visionary leader who took his country, country, maybe that, maybe Daytron is a country at this point, but um, took his, his company from $10 million to $200 million in just six years. 
And so we're going to hear more about how he did that incredible uh, transformation. But he also founded the Servant Leadership, Servant Leadership Institute. And I've been to a couple of their, their uh, annual meetings, and it's just phenomenal. So you are, I'm so delighted that you all are here. Let me just give you a quick flyby on today because we have a, a significant number of people that have never been to a Leadership Insight Forum before. This is one of the blessings of being virtual. I mean, we got people from across the country that are here with us today, and we're going to be probably topping out about 100 folks. So for those of you that are um, first time with us, I'm going to give you the 30-second flyby. 11 years ago, um, two other buddies of mine, Bill Exeter and Alan Niven, who, had, who are brilliant in their real estate world, uh, Bill has a 1031 exchange company, and, and Alan is a leading economist, demographer, and author. Had never met each other, introduced the two of them, but over breakfast, we were talking about kind of where things were with the economy. This was in August of 2008. Now, think back. Was there anything happening in the world at that time? Yeah, uh, the whole world was coming apart. At least that's what the media was trying to make us believe. Much like today, I feel like we're getting a whole new uh, media ploy. Sorry for those of my friends that are in the media business, but um, the fact is that there is so much good going on that was not being reported economically and otherwise. So we decided we would do one event because as a business owner, if you're getting skewed data, if you're getting things that, are, that is just simply not true or only partially true or maybe true for two people over in Africa or in New England, some, somewhat similar, I guess, maybe, but um, I know my New England friends are going to hate me for that. But, you know, again, how do you make good decisions when you've got skewed data? So we thought we'd do one event, uh, and here we are now, well over 50 events that we've done in San Diego alone, plus another five in Las Vegas and no end in sight. So the, the purpose of, of our nonprofit, the Center for Wealth and Legacy, and you can go to wealthlegacycenter.org, wealthlegacycenter.org to get more information, get some things about today's events and future events. But the, the purpose of the center is just is three things. Number one, we want to connect. We want to connect like-minded people and want to leave a lasting positive impact in the world. And so that's the beauty. We get to come together as a community uh, which is why we're so pleased to be also here using the, the Spire network as well. Uh, my dear friend, Larry Kessler, you see their picture uh, is the CEO and President and Chief Connecting Officer of, of uh, Spire, formerly known as Corporate Alliance. Many of those faces that I see, handsome faces I see smiling at me are members. If you're not, you really need to check out Spire and what they do uh, because it's an extraordinary bringing together of people that want to do business, but who also want to leave a lasting positive impact in the world. So um, check out Spire. I've talked with my friend Larry Kessler. Um, but again, the first goal of Wealth Legacy, the Center for Wealth and Legacy is to connect. We want to inspire. You're going to be inspired by hearing the story of Art Barter. You're going to be inspired by listening to Dr. Nick and, and what they've got for us. And then the last part is we want to challenge. Connect, inspire, challenge. We want to challenge you to whatever that music is that's in your soul. If there's something you look out and you read the paper and you say, you know what, doggone it, somebody should do something about that. Well, why not you? Why not you? I remember when I was listening to a speaker talking about the landmines in Cambodia and Vietnam. And all of a sudden that little still small voice says, well, why don't you go do something about that? It's like, what can I do? There are millions of unexploded landmines in those countries. But then I got to think, well, yeah, I've run eight marathons to raise money for leukemia and lymphoma. Why couldn't I also raise money and go over and help with landmine victims, which is what I ended up doing 13 years ago. And in the, co in the co course of that, ended up meeting my lovely Cambodian wife who lives here in San Diego, and in fact, has been in San Diego longer than me. So God has a way of doing that. When you think you're doing something to give back, you end up getting more in your basket than what you could possibly give away, because that's just the way God does things in the universe. So anyway, thanks for being here. That's a quick flyby on the Center for Wealth and Legacy. So again, go to wealthlegacycenter.org for more info. Um, my for-profit, where we also do a whole bunch of stuff, is, is wealthlegacygroup.com, which you'll see RJ at wealthlegacygroup.com on my uh, uh, screen there. Okay, uh, a couple more things. Um, so um, that's what we're doing. Let me do a quick share screen there. Um, and as I say, this is not what I do for a living, gang. So don't hold me <laughs> to the standards of the TV folks. 
Um, but that's a quick flyby there. I want to thank also our friends, the McKinney's, and um, also Ignite Visibility, and a good friend, Terry Moore, who's the most remarkable real estate advisor, consultant, um, our friends at Spire, and of course, us at Wealth Legacy Group. So I want to, before I introduce Nick, I want to just give you a quick flyby also on what we're doing here, how this is going to work this morning. So um, Nick is going to be with us. We're going to have got some questions for him, and uh, Nick's going to share with us till about eight o'clock or so. I will monitor the questions, and then we'll see if we can have a little bit of, of live Q and A. Um, I'm probably going to just take those questions off the chat box. So if you've got a question, if you would go to the, sh the chat box that's shown on your bottom of your screen there, just type in your question, and we'll get to those as many as we can. Uh, Nick has Dr. Nick has as He's constantly being pinged. I mean, I've, I've gotten texts from Dr. Nick at nine o'clock in the evening and he's still in meetings and early in the morning. So this guy, I don't think sleeps, but he's got a tremendous passion for <clears throat> giving back. So we're gonna have Nick till about, Dr. Nick till about 8.15. Then we're gonna have, um, I'll start my interview with, with Art Barter from Datron. Um, that's going to go till around nine o'clock. We'll take a break then and uh, we'll have some Q&A time with, with Art as well at that point. Um, and then if you want to, to stick around, we're going to break up into table groups and, and really dig into deeply, more deeply, um, the content that you've heard today. Because again, the goal of, of what we're doing here with the Leadership Insights Forum is not just to give you amazing interviews with extraordinary leaders. But it's to take that and unpack that. And then how do you apply that in your own life? Because if all you're doing is just collecting great information, but not dispensing it, not living it out, guess what? You just wasted your time. And a great idea that's heard but not implemented within 72 hours is what the research says. If that idea is not implemented within 72 hours, it will not get implemented. So, by the way, I'm going to raise my desk up. So... Hopefully, I'm not going to knock anything over, but there you go. Okay, for stand-up desk people, here you go. That's a great tool. Um, so the point of it is, great ideas. Have a, I hope you've got a legal pad in front of you or something to take notes with. Um, and again, it said that our thoughts unravel themselves across our lips and through our fingertips. Our thoughts unravel themselves across our lips and through our fingertips. So write these great ideas down that you're going to hear from Art and also from Dr. Nick and make sure that you've got them down so that you can then implement them because the goal is within the next 24 hours, uh, I want you to be able to do that. And having these groups afterwards will also enable having that group chat. So we're gonna, for those that are still remaining, uh, around 9.15 or so, 9.30, we're gonna, or yeah, about 9.15, uh, we're gonna break up into groups for uh, approximately 25 minutes. And so we'll be done at 9.45. So if you need to bust out earlier, bless you. But if you can stick around, great. I think you're going to really want to. And we've got folks that have offered to be facilitators. I'm not sure how we're going to quite make that work out, but <laughs> I'm trusting Larry we're going to make that happen. Oh. So without further ado, uh, let me get to Dr. Okay. Nick. Uh, um, some, did somebody have? Okay. So Dr. Nick Ifantides, or Dr. Nick, as we most affectionately call him, uh, MD, MPH is an advocate for those in the community who need it the most. I love the, the description I love about Dr. Dick is he's a pair of lips attached to a heart. That describes Dr. Dick in it perfectly. Um, he served the last 11 years as the chief medical officer for the County of San Diego. For the last 13 years, he's also been the national director of health and wellness for Axine Health Partners, LLC. Um, his life story is, uh, is about addressing per personal health needs and achieving transformation of personal health. And, it, and that story, that's an amazing story. It's been in People Magazine. It's been in, let's see, Reader's Digest, Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, Fox News, Discovery Channel, and even the National Enquirer. I'm not sure if that's when he grew the ponytail or if that was before. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't ask those questions. That's not for me to know. But you can ask. Uh, Dr. Nick is a cancer survivor. Um, he's been to as many countries as you can imagine. He, likes, he says, I've been to many countries because I'm very old. Yeah, come on. Now, always willing to lend a hand uh, and just um, 
one of the things that I was uh, disappointed for him, he was selected to be to give the the address to Azusa Pacific uh, University for their their send off. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. So Nick, hopefully this will be some small way <laughs> you get to, to have that back. He is truly one of the most recognized faces here in the San Diego community on the, the COVID-19 issues. Um, residents see him in the county as, as a, in terms of what's happening with this disease. And so that, those are the kind of questions that we want to ask. And so he's, he's on a passionate mission to make a difference and, and uh, truly one of the most um, wonderful, kind, and, and, and truly brilliant men that you're going to meet. So with that, um, Dr. Nick, thank you again so much for, for fitness into your schedule. I really appreciate it. Let me get some, a couple of questions to get things started out with. And, you know, I guess, um, actually, is there anything you want to start us out with before I start launching into some of my questions? Let me, let me put that over to you. Anything you want to hit out, hit out of the park to start with, or um, do you want me just to go into my question? Yeah, just a couple echoes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, RJ, and thank you, Art. My apologies ahead of time, Brother Art, that I will uh, have to jump off after I'm done, so I'm sorry I'll miss you, but if I get the link, I'll watch it after the fact. Um, two things I want to say quickly, RJ. You know, as I was listening to your intro, the opportunity that we have to learn from each other and then apply it in each other's lives uh, reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, and that is that the beginning of true friendship happens when one person says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. And uh, I just love the concept of us being open and vulnerable and receptive to learn from each other's paths. Secondly, um, I want to share in the context of what we're going to talk about um, that I would please uh, ask for permission to not just speak from the heart, but to speak graciously and speak honestly, realizing that uh, the issues that I think we're going to talk about, which is the whole COVID uh, crisis and the balancing act between health and commerce and everything, it's very controversial. And um, I've been humbled, to be honest with you, RJ, especially over the course of the last few weeks at how personal some of the dialogue has gotten um, and how at times I've personally, frankly, come under attack. So my heart is a little guarded, but I just want to upfront uh, confess and acknowledge that I will commit to being vulnerable and transparent and uh, just pray that I can do so in, in the spirit of humility uh, and honesty and have people accept that. So I thought I would just mention that up front. Wow, that's great, Nick. And, and it, is, it is a challenge. And again, folks, it's so easy to armchair quarterback these things and look back at what we could have, would have, should have done. Uh, and, and I guess that's the, the a good opening question is you know, when, we, when we look back at how we've handled COVID-19, and again, a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, what do you think we will have learned? Or what do you think we, um, what, do, what do you think we got right? And, and what are some things that we, you know, would do differently next time? Because there will be a next time. We don't know. This is what we refer to as an event-driven recession, although somebody quipped that this is a, a recession by proclamation, that we've been told certain things, and so it's brought recession. But the fact is, um, we are going to be looking back and, and tearing this thing apart. What do, you, what do you think those lessons are that we will learn when we get to the other side? Well, again, um, I'm going to answer that by saying this. I think this crisis has revealed the impact that our own lenses and our own filters have on the way that we respond to things. I think this crisis was also one that is very unprecedented and something that we have never previously experienced before, certainly in our lifetimes. And so it had a lot of elements to it and still does of being an unchartered course. And it is beyond fascinating to me to see now the track record of different parts of the country and different parts of the world that have handled things differently. And now the data is starting to catch up. And so 
you know, I playfully tell people at least one person once a day as a man of faith and God, I trust, but you, you got to show me your data. And part of the challenge, <laughs> part of the challenge, uh, RJ, as I think everybody would appreciate is when you're dealing with something completely new, completely unprecedented, um, there is no data. And so it's so easy to say, well, Last month you said this, and this month you're saying that. Well, I have new data this sure. month that I didn't have last month. It's and progressive so revelation. There's a it? tremendous amount of subjectivity involved, truly. Yeah, and all you can do is make the best decisions you can with the data you've got at hand and move forward. I mean, and again, so uh, for example, that, that ties in well to this next question. I, I, I was fascinated that the uh, Colorado, in the state of Colorado, which ha interestingly enough has a democratic governor. Uh, and yet he has chosen to revise the way they track Corona deaths um, because in fact, the change that they made down, uh, turned the death count downward by, by almost 24%. Because what they've been doing is that anybody who died with the coronavirus and may have died from something else, but if they had coronavirus, they were being counted as being a corona death. And so they said, no, we're going to stop doing that. We're only going to track the people. We're going to bifurcate it, actually. We're going to count total deaths, but we're going to go and count those that have actually died of coronavirus one way, one number. And then we'll also track the number of people that have COVID-19 are dying from something else. They'd actually, they found when they did the research that somebody who had died of alcohol poisoning, the guy had drunk himself into a stupor, died of the alcohol poisoning, but because he tested positive for, for COVID, they treated him as a COVID death. Uh, I understand that, that New York City, um, in the officials there made a decision to count the deaths of people that were presumed to have coronavirus if they had certain symptoms. They're actually counting them as dying from COVID-19. I found this fascinating, uh, Deborah, Dr. Deborah Burks, the physician who oversees the current administration's uh, coronavirus response said, there's nothing from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, that I trust as far as the accuracy of their uh, of infections, the death count. And so the question is, um, and she was saying that it, it, we may be overstating the number of deaths by as much as 25%. And yet, um, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's also one of the leading epidemiologists, uh, says that the, the corona death count is probably higher than we are, are predicting it is right now. What's, what's the truth of this? I mean, how do we sort all that stuff out? Yeah, um, let me, RJ, you asked a lot there, but let me try to <laughs> distill and- I've been accused of that. And well, let me try to distill and prioritize a few things. And again, I think knowing, I'm not here to, you know, give a science lecture today. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about uh, lessons learned from navigating different challenges and so forth. So I'm, I'm keeping that lens in mind, brother, rather than going right down into the science, because, you know, just what you asked right there could take the entire time we have together. But let me answer a couple things. And this is what is challenging. And I will confess, as uh, San Diego County's chief medical officer, I'm very blessed to be part of a very innovative county, a very progressive county. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to tie in that I realized I didn't have a chance with your first question, I know that we have people from around the country today, but I would imagine several from San Diego County. San Diego was way ahead of the curve, folks, in that we declared the emergency very proactively compared to other parts of the state and certainly compared to the nation. Uh, we also instituted our social distancing. And I say this with humility, but I say it with conviction. I believe with all my heart that San Diego County is the most locked, loaded, and prepared region of the country. And there are some reasons for that in that we were one of the areas of the country that had very early experience with this and that we had evacuees from Wuhan, China, before there was ever a community transmission. But to your point, RJ, about the CDC and the counting of numbers and so on and so forth, 
That is exactly what makes this whole situation such an adventure for me. And um, I never imagined, never prepared in medical school, and was never anticipating being in a position of such high stakes of making decisions that affected so many people, but making decisions that were really dualistic in the sense, if I could over, over simply summarize, on the one hand, I feel like I made decisions in February and March designed to protect the health and well-being of humanity and to protect the integrity of the healthcare system to be able to respond accordingly. Having made those decisions, there were positive consequences in that San Diego uh, compared to many other places, has had a very uneventful physical and health system capacity course of events, which is a good thing. Yes, it is. The problem is because of the inevitability of what we did, while saving lives, we've killed an economy. We've devastated humanity from an economic, from an employment, from a host of other perspectives. And I just feel like people I wish would be mindful of the fact, especially for those of us like myself who are people of faith, I prayed through every decision that I made, not in ignorance of the consequences that the health decisions would have on the economic devastation. But what's complicated, and this is playing itself out, and I'm gonna say this from a nonpartisan, but from a transparent perspective, What's happening at a national level, at a state level, and even at a local level is that there is now tension, and it's getting to the point where it's very hostile at times between, well, the health versus the economic. What I'm trying to find is that balance, and it's tough mm -hmm. to do, between the health and the economic. Yes. But even in the way the data is presented, I have to tell you, I have great concerns with some decisions that are being made because one could get the data to tell one story or another. And if you're then finding yourself either massaging or manipulating the data one way or the other, and if the intention is not to stay true to the picture of what is actually happening, but trying to manipulate data to reinforce your preconception, that's where it gets very tricky. Mm -hmm. And to the point of the classifications of death, let me just illustrate it this way. In San Diego County, 25% of our positive cases as of this week, the total, are in individuals who are 60 years and older. Hear that, 25% 60 years of age and older, meaning 75% of the cases are less than 60. But when you look at the deaths, 85% of the deaths are in that same age category, mm -hmm. 60 years old and older. So what does that tell me? That tells me that as an elderly individual, you are more susceptible, you are more compromised, you are more at risk. Why? Because older folks are more likely to have chronic medical conditions. As a physician, if you get sick and you get infected with COVID and you die from COVID, you died from complications of COVID. If you had underlying medical conditions, that put you at greater risk. If you were younger and without those complications, your resilience would have been such that you would have had a better chance to fend it off. Now, if I'm trying to minimize, because my lens is purely or predominantly or nearly exclusively the economic lens, I wanna say, well, Many of the people who died had other issues going on, so it really wasn't COVID. Well, from a physician's perspective, those underlying issues put you at greater risk. Now, is it possible to have COVID and die from other things? 
We've done that in San Diego. We have had some people, and not to be too graphic, but who have committed suicide or who have been murdered or who have had a terrible motor vehicle accident. If you died of one of those things and you had COVID, clearly it's not what COVID, it's not something that COVID caused your death of. But if you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have pulmonary disease, you have cancer, and you get infected with COVID, and you struggle with respiratory systems and multi-organ failure and so on and so forth, ultimately you died of complications of COVID, even though you had those other complications. So to me, and I know it's a complex answer, RJ, but I'll, I'll stop at that and say underlying conditions does not negate the fact that you died from complications of COVID. It implies that you are more vulnerable to dying of complications of COVID. But to say, for example, that the only COVID deaths that count are the ones that only had COVID without underlying conditions, frankly, that's completely irresponsible and something that I don't agree with at all. Sure. And, and I think it, it's the story of the, the people that die with cancer and die from cancer. I mean, the fact is we all, many of us have cancer already in our system, but our immune system keeps it in check. Um, and so we may die though from cancer or we might die with cancer. And it, it, it is a complicated issue. I understand that. And it, I think it was Britt Hume that quipped, um, we may not have flattened the curve, but we sure flattened the economy. <laughs> yeah. So it's that tension that you're referring to. Um, how do we balance that? And, and it leads into a couple of questions. And, and unfortunately, I know we're running out of time for you. And, and we, I see there's questions that we want to try and get to as well. Um, one of the things that San Diego is doing so well, it seems like testing. I know we're over 4,000 people a day testing. I, in fact, I just got my results back. Thank the Lord, I'm a negative. But um, are we... Um, are we ahead of other communities in testing? Are we behind? And is there a reason, if we are behind, is there a reason why, why folks aren't getting tested? And, and who should? Who should go out now? Because the county is doing a spectacular job of providing free testing. Um, it's not, not the most comfortable thing in the world to have a nasal swab, but on the other hand, it, you forget about it 30 minutes later. So talk about the testing aspect and who should get tested and and then we want it, we need to wrap up with a question about when we do get back to work which is probably starting to happen here imminently how do we keep ourselves safe um how do we develop this herd immunity I and mean, one of the challenges is how do we develop herd immunity when you keep the herd under lockdown I haven't figured that one out yet but okay um, so what's that going to look like how do we go back to work keep it safe and especially as employers how do business owners take care of the team but also you know, do business, uh, but keep themselves from being sued because they forgot to wipe down the handle four times on Tuesday. No. So the testing issue first, um, you know, there is no doubt that when San Diego got started, as was the case with everywhere in the country, frankly, there were limitations that uh, were inevitable because frankly, we just, weren't prepared. And that's not a criticism. I think that's based on the nature of the beast and the time that it took to develop tests and not just to develop tests, but to develop tests that were accurate. And so initially we had major limitations just in terms of the specific things that we needed, the supplies, the mechanics, the reagents, the chemicals to do the actual testing. That is clearly resolved, and we're at a point now where San Diego County uh, is leading the pack in terms of the amount of testing that we are doing, and we have greater testing capacity than we are currently utilizing, meaning that now the availability, if you would, from having been hungry for testing materials, now there's a buffet and there's more than we uh, are frankly utilizing. The testing trends are positive in the sense that the percentage of the tests that we are doing are frankly heading in the right direction. And so that is a good yes. thing. And, um, but, you know, there, there, are, <laughs> there are factors at play in terms of, um, I will say, uh, the false security, potentially 
The fact that I see a lot of people letting their guard down, again, it's another controversial thing that I fully support, though, uh, and that is the masking aspect. Just last night, I had the rare opportunity of an hour while it was still daylight and came home and immediately got my two daughters and our dog and went to uh, Kit Carson Park in Escondido, where I live, and we went for a walk. And I have to tell you, I was uh, grieved to see uh, as my daughters and I were being compliant because we were walking by people, uh, grieved and shocked at how uh, non-cooperative uh, and mm -hmm. non-compliant people were being with wearing masks. And so that leads to my next uh, point, and that is to answer your question about safety into the future. What concerns me a little bit, and this is the chicken and egg and the cart horse thing, the fact that San Diego, and let's focus on San Diego since that's where I am and what I know the best, that we have done as well as we have done is not a reflection that, oh, there's nothing to see here, folks, keep moving. It's because of the social distancing and because of the things that we put in place. As those social distancing measures are relaxed, I think if there is a predominant perspective, well, there was really nothing going on here and people just go back to living their lives as if nothing happened, Mm -hmm. we are going to see a spike. A and that is clearly occurring in other parts of the world. And I can't stress enough, and this is where the lenses come into play again. There is a aggressive subset of our population, some of them who are my friends, who I literally am listening to or looking at and going, who are you and what happened to the person I knew, who are trying <laughs> to convince me the guy who was part of doing a lot of this, that this was all a government conspiracy meant to impose government control on society and that it was all unfounded, a hoax and unnecessary. And I'm, I'm like in shock as I'm interacting with these people, realizing that they don't fully grasp the fact that they are healthy and doing well is because we did mm -hmm. facilitate these protective measures. And if now you're going to go living your life, and by the way, late last night, if you haven't seen the paper today, California accepted San Diego County's uh, acceleration plan. And mm -hmm. as of today, Fantastic. restaurants and retail outlets are open for business. What concerns me from, from a stewardship perspective is that if people are going to go right back into those environments and handle themselves the way that they did before, we have major challenges ahead. And so I'm just very mindful of that. And I know, RJ, real quick, I need to slip it in here. The other thing that is at play for San Diego specifically is the fact that we are a multinational community. 3.3 million residents of San Diego, right next to nearly 2 million residents of Tijuana, and uh, another nearly million folks over in Mexicali. The other dynamic that I just want to keep on people's radar screens is, you know, people talk about Sweden a lot as a place where they didn't do lockdowns. Well, their death rate per million is, as of yesterday, one of the highest, if not the highest in the entire world. They're a different culture. They're very sparsely populated. They don't live intergenerationally. Well, guess what? Right across the border from us in Tijuana, you have a different set of circumstances. You have a different dynamic. And they too, and I'm not being critical, but there was a bit of a delay in social distancing down there and doing the things that we did. Guess what happened over the last 48 hours? Hospitals in Mexicali completely full in overwhelmed Imperial County. Many of the hospitals in Tijuana completely full. There is a potential humanitarian crisis unfolding just south of the border with the potential of that spilling over to San Diego. So my caution to those of you on the line and to society in general, don't let your guard down. This thing is not over yet. 
So, Dr. Nick, I, we've got so many questions, and I apologize right now in advance for folks. We've got a limited time with Dr. Nick, but I'm going to try and um, get to some of these before we have to let you go. Um, so, w one gentleman, uh, or what I guess it, Beth is asking, um, I'm a CEO of a community health center. My providers are used to evidence-based medicine. It's hard to convince them to go with data. Um, we have to, to try something. We can't wait until everything is there. How do we, how do we change that traditional model of medicine that um, where I, th I think the question there really is, um, we may not have time to wait for all the data to come in over the next five years. We have to make decisions now. And so how do we balance that? Well, and this goes back, and here's how I would answer that. Then trust those of us who do this 24-7. As RJ said, and I'm not exaggerating, since January 31st, I've not had a pillow in my day for more than three hours. And there are some of us who are pouring over every piece of information that we have from Taiwan, from South Korea, from China, from Iran, from the UK, from New York, from New Orleans, from Mexico, and the guidance, that, and I'm not asking for blind submission, no, but because this is such a quickly evolving situation, and that's another element that's so difficult and frankly hard for me to see playing out at the national level, and you implied it in the way you asked your question, RJ, is the deterioration of credibility in some of the entities of our nation, like the CDC, that have always been considered the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there is this projected lack of confidence. And so you're absolutely right, whoever asked that question. And that's the issue with something that's slowly evolving. We may not have as much data as we're used to, hence work in cooperation with those of us who are living and breathing this. And when we give the guidance and the suggestions, we're not doing it to ruin anybody's lives. I'm not sitting behind the county, you know, dais trying to impose things to destroy the economy. People need to know that there are people who love this community, who care for this community, Dr. Wooten, Dr. McDonald, myself, and we're doing our best to integrate all of this information and come up with recommendations that we hope folks will follow. So. Again, I'm, I'll try to give you bullet answers and quickly, RJ, so you can get through it, but I'll leave it at that. Yep, and Beth, thank you. That was a terrific question. And one of the things that uh, I've appreciated is how, how much this, the county is doing about getting information out. I get my text every day from the county that tells me <laughs> what's going on, where the testing is, how many people have passed away, um, just all kinds of different statistics. San Diego and you, Dr. Nick, and, and, and Wilma and the team there have just done a phenom phenomenal job of keeping us informed. Um, here's a great question, uh, Mike. Family, uh, others that are, are having to basically homeschool their kids. <laughs> you know, as my sister-in-law puts it, look, I love my kids, uh, but I didn't sign up to be a full-time teacher and, you know, be a mom. And, and Where are we at for schools? You know, what's your professional opinion on, on restarting schools? Um, thoughts on that? Well, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I hear that and I get that. And I'm a single father of a 15 and a 12 year old folks. So please hear that. I get that completely as a man who works the way I do, um, who's had two children, quote unquote, that I, by the way, pulled out of school prematurely with a sense of what was about to happen. So my girls were out of school before the schools closed down because I had a quote unquote, conviction and a very strong sense about what was going to happen. And I must say, and we'll tie this into the answer, I have a 70-year-old mother of mine living with me who's the caregiver for my girl. So a big part of my motivation is protecting her by isolating and protecting them because she's the one at risk. But the issue of schools is the following. Um, in the abundance of caution, the, even though the experience with children who are infected is not as dramatic as that for adults, um, the decisions were made about school. I will say that there is 
a high likelihood that kids will be going back to school in the fall, but I think it will be with some meaningful modifications. Mm -hmm. I still think that there will be a need to do some social distancing within the school context. And again, this isn't just about the children. In California and many parts of the United States, very different than Sweden, very similar to Mexico, you have a lot of intergenerational people living with yes. each other. Right. And so the concern is about in protecting the kids is about protecting who the kids will be exposed to. So again, the quick answer, I'm pretty confident that there will be schooling, but it will be different than what we have been accustomed to. And frankly, I expect in order to stagger things and have smaller classrooms and allow for greater spacing, I think next school year will in all likelihood be a hybridized model where kids may be on campus shorter hours and doing more supplemental homeschoolish kind of a hybrid of the last couple months in normal school. I will quickly say there are some pretty significant universities, the biggest one uh, in California being Cal State, that they have already notified and made the decision uh, that their fall classes will be virtual only. The UCs are still trying to um, and are intending to have in-person education. And again, here you've got two state institutions with a different strategy. Welcome to the very adventurous nature of this crisis. It's a fascinating one. Super. Well, I know that uh, Singapore, um, Taiwan, China, and others have models for education where, in fact, they didn't close the schools down, but they, they handled the educational model very differently than we did. But they were also taking temperature at, you know, on every student that walked in, and they were doing things very um, prophylactically to, in advance to, to try to deal with this. So again, a different model than, than what we've done. Also, they're Asian and Asians follow the rules and they wear masks and they do things that <laughs> as us free entrepreneurs type Americans, we, a lot of us don't. So um, I know there's a, a, a wonderful company called Aegis Sciences that has, th their lab has been approved for California. They've done already 7,000 tests. So I just, uh, I'm getting, um, shout out if there's if there's a need for more testing there might be some collaborative sorts of things that could be done uh with our uh, young man named uh, whitman uh, his father's fraternity brother of mine so Whit, i'm glad you were able to join us today and see if we can get you connected i know he's also an asu alum or, or apu sorry and, uh, as a specific alum um last question and then we're gonna we're just gonna have to wrap this up dr nick because i know we need to let you go on um Will will we know? Will we be able to trace back, or do do you think we definitively at this point know um, how this virus came to even come upon us? Um, it's extraordinary to me to watch the Chinese disinformation. And again, I'm not trying to poke anybody in the eye. It's just the fact is I'm I'm reading what various politicians from China are are in, insinuating that America brought the virus over to them. It's like seriously. Um, so again, it, it's not so much um, finding fault as it is finding solutions. I mean, that's really ultimately what's important is how do we get solutions to this? How do we get the vaccines out uh, as quickly as possible? But is, is it important for us to uh, even know where the virus came from in the big scheme of things? And if so, what are your, what's your take on that? Yeah, a couple things. This is... Um... This is a tough question because uh, let me just say up front, I don't believe anybody knows conclusively one way or the other, but let me do, um, let me, <laughs> I will say this. There are some unusual things about this virus that um, are very weird and it makes me a little bit concerned um, based on some of the complexity of its origin on whether or not we we know the full story. I will say that, and I have friends on the ground in China, my own EMS medical director, by the way, called me in a panic on Sunday, January 5th, because of her international connections. And um, that was very early uh, in the process, because she heard from some of her Chinese colleagues, I'm just a local person 
don't have a national level of influence, but there was definitely some um, mismanagement of information and sharing and not necessarily as much transparency as one would think. Um, the idea that this was a weaponized virus or originated in a lab, all I can say is that that is a possibility that we don't know yet. Um, I do think, uh, ideally, with time, that question could be answered, but based on the nature of um, the government involved and who knows what evidence is being covered or has been destroyed or whatever, time hopefully will tell. What I will emphasize on this virus, and I'll do this perhaps as the closer, and going back to the whole complexity and why polarized lenses, in my opinion, have no place in what we are navigating, is I wish there was a greater sense of unity and humility and acknowledgement of what a difficult situation this is for the following reason. This is a completely novel, I'll call it virgin, it's a brand new virus that has never infected humanity before. It clearly has the capacity to spread obviously very rapidly. It is a perplexion in the sense that there are people who can be infected with it that have no symptoms whatsoever. And there are other people who can get infected with it and who have devastating consequences. Why does one person react one way and another person another way? The issue for me is that because it's a novel virus, we don't have immunity, we don't have a vaccine, and we do not have proven medications. The whole controversy on hydroxychloroquine and the president taking it, again, we could talk about that stuff in ad nauseum from a scientific perspective. There is no conclusive medical proven treatment yet. There's indications of some benefit, but that's not proof. Sure. When you take all of those things into consideration, RJ, that's my whole point is that when you're fighting an enemy that you have no weapons against, the only option you have for a period of time is to hide. And we did hide. And we did so effectively. And as a result, we've been safe. But the irony is now people are looking at it from, oh, we overreact. No, there was no overreaction. We took cover because we had no weaponry. As people now re-enter society, my hope is that they will do so cautiously, thoughtfully, and safely, because otherwise, that enemy, which we know is still out there, could have the potential of devastating effect. And I will say my last comment is this. Thankfully, this is the month of May. Based on cycles, the last two years, we've been spared of a serious detrimental flu season. My heart is very guarded, not for the next two to four months, but my heart is very guarded if we still have meaningful community transmission of coronavirus in the late fall with the influenza virus on top of it, many of the things that we have in place may be called into duty, including things like the Federal Medical Station, the Palomar Medical Center that we haven't needed yet. We are prepared, folks, for a surge to come that maybe this has just been spring training for. So more to come. And this is what is so humbling to me. And this is what is so hard is the matter of fact objectivity that to me is way premature considering how complicated and how new this whole crisis is to us. Well, as, as a marathon runner, I can relate to the example of this, this is not a sprint. This is truly a marathon. We, are, we may only be in the first 10K or maybe even less so far. But um, the good news is we've got one of the brightest countries. We've got some of the brightest minds working on this. And there are, one of the other things I've noticed that uh, I've read from the epidemiologists is that this is a slow uh, mutating virus. So the good news is when we do come up with the vaccines, I'm, I'm reading that very likely that vaccine will be good for 
quite a while, may not be for the, a lifetime, uh, but like Jonas Salk was able to bring us a vaccine, had some enormous uh, implications for us health-wise. The other thing I thought was interesting is the CDC completely reversed themselves. They've now said that um, you can't, <laughs> that the, this, uh, their fear was that you could, for up to three days later, if you had a contaminated surface, you could end up with COVID-19. Apparently now they have said, you know what, we were wrong. This thing does not seem to be that virulent in terms of transmission. But the main thing is we have to be looking at this, and Dr. Nick, I'm hearing you say this, and boy, from what I'm reading, it's very true. Whether you think we went overboard or not, the fact is we do need to be cautious. We need to be attentive. We don't need to be paralyzed with fear, but we need to be aware. And I mean, thanks to my germaphobe wife, I've, I've learned actually to have lots of wipes with me and to make sure I'm you know, wiping things down and taking good care. And that's just gonna keep us all healthier. Dr. Nick, oh my gosh, every time I'm with you, I learn so much. And more, but again, more than anything else, it's your heart, it's your love for the work that you do, it's your love for the people that it impacts. You take your, your role so seriously. I, I just, I value that so much. And so on behalf of, of, a, of a grateful 3.3 million people here in San Diego County, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you to your incredible team that's working such long hours in very stressful circumstances. Um, thank you. Bless you, my friend. God bless you, RJ. Thank you, and God bless you, Art. Have a good session. Forgive me, I do need to log off, okay? Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Um, I neglected to mention that this is being recorded. So everybody who's on, and I know there were a number of folks that, that were not able to, they had previous commitments. So we'll be sending this out. And if you uh, want to um, also forward that on to anybody else, terrific. So, and it, when you go also to the wealthlegacygroup.com website, that's our for-profit website, and if you go to videos, you'll find a whole collection that we did. Uh, we did a five-day event called Will Your Business Survive COVID-19? 17 subject matter experts, of which Dr. Nick was one. Uh, it was extraordinarily um, insightful in a whole variety of ways, that, that ways. You don't have to be a business owner to, to get great value from that. Uh, but particularly uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday was focused on uh, business owners, but Mondays and Fridays had some, some great content that I think you'll find helpful as well. So go to wealthlegacygroup.com, click on videos for that section. Um, also, just before I sign off and introduce um, Art Barter, extraordinarily here, uh, a, another friend, Jerry, has reminded us that there's a some degree of, a great deal of degree of, of application to the great influenza outbreak that occurred in um, 1918, the Spanish flu. And so there's a book, uh, The Great Influenza by John Barry, that, um, so thanks, Jerry, for, for putting that on. All right, so let me now get back to, ran into this before. Okay, so our friend Art Barter. Art is the CEO and president of Daytron World Communications. Um, he came in to a company that was a, Approximate value at the time was $10 million. They, um, they make these extraordinary communication equipment for our, for our military. I mean, but these things are so durable, I swear they could take a direct rocket hit and they would still be functioning. But not only that, they, Datron provides products to other militaries in other countries, but um, as you'll hear as we get into our interview, what Art has done is really transformed the whole culture at Daytron from being a very autocratic, um, top-down type of leadership and change that into very much a servant-driven leadership model. And so the result, this little international radio manufacturer that nobody ever heard of is now a $200 million juggernaut. And to, to Art, again, just who he is, um, he's been approached many, many times to, to buy his company because it has become so successful. But because the culture of the acquiring potential suitors um, just didn't fit the model of this servant-hearted, servant leadership model, he's had to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. So foregoing great personal financial gain, and he would never tell you this, so that's why I'm doing it. 
but that's the kind of leader that he is, is it? It's not about him. It's about the team that they've assembled and what servant leadership looks like, authentic servant leadership looks like, which we're, that's why you're here. So in addition, Art founded the Servant Leadership Institute. That's a vehicle to, to share uh, his, his knowledge and teach others how to inspire and equip um, those that they're influencing. By adopting a serve first attitude and implementing proven principles and strategies, thousands of people, literally thousands of people across the globe have enriched their personal and professional lives. They've built healthier and more profitable companies. Those go hand in hand, by the way. They don't have to be an exclusive. They can't, you can, you can have a profitable, healthy company and also have a servant led company and also create happy, happier and more engaged employees. Uh, so Art and Lori have uh, Lori, five kids. How many Art? Uh, <laughs> oh no, no, please, please, RJ, two, just two, two. two kids, just right? two. Yes. Uh -huh. right. And uh, I may be counting the grandkids in that uh, because yeah. I, and my wife and I are now happy grandparents as of last Thursday. So yay! Um, my whole world now is just about counting more babies. And yay! So Art Barter, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and. Uh, Let's just start off with one of my favorite questions, which is, hey, tell us about you and you know what you're excited about, what you're passionate about, um, what you're looking forward to, what, and, and just what gets your juices flowing. Yeah, thank you, RJ, for having me on again. It's, it's great to be back with everybody. Um, and, you know, what, what drives me, um, I have to be able to smile at work. Uh, you have to have fun <laughs> first and foremost, right? Uh, but when you can live your values that you have as an individual, then um, and they're in sync with the company values and you have a great purpose, it helps you as an individual find your why. And I always like to say, when you find your why, you'll find your way. Now, people will find their why at different stages in their life. Um, and I really like to see that transformation in people. Um, but you know, we're all about helping others and it's all about um, helping people grow and learn and serve other people. And uh, that's when we see that happen and we don't seek recognition for that because we believe that because of my faith, you don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. So you don't seek you do it quietly because it really comes from your heart, um, not for some um, corporate reason. Um, so I like to see people grow and learn and really use their entire potential. Um, so, you know, serving others is, is up there. Uh, I like to tell people I, I serve an audience of one because of my faith. Um, that keeps me grounded most of the time. Um, I'm not perfect. I'll, I'll tell everybody that right up front. Um, but I love to see people grow and learn and then lead from their heart uh, because it really comes from their heart. Uh, then it goes to their brain, then it goes to their hands. Um, so I'm very passionate about um, servant leadership. Beth asked a question of Dr. Nick. Um, we know uh, Beth, uh, she's a great servant leader, CEO, has brought in, uh, has taken servant leadership into the organization, serving patients back there. We love what she does. Um, so we're passionate about helping people, uh, and that's the common thing. Um, and we're passionate about doing it with humility and privacy. Our, what did you walk into? Because I, I know without... I mean, we don't have to mention any names, obviously, but but what was the the system that you ran into the culture, if you will, um, and then how were you able to change that over time? Yeah, the interesting part is I started with Datron in 1997, uh, didn't buy it until 2004. The reason I was so interested in Datron is 90% of their business at the time was done outside the United States, in countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka countries throughout Africa. And uh, RJ, I didn't know where some of those countries were. I said, I wanna to go to work for them just to find out where those countries are. <laughs> um, never knew where Sri Lanka uh, was, and it's a teardrop off the end of, of um, India. And I ended up coming to work for them as their CFO, uh, ended up taking on responsibility for operations. 
And you know, un until you leave the country and spend time on uh, continents like Africa, um, uh, Middle East, uh, places in Asia, you don't realize how good you have it. Um, sure. And I spent a lot of time in Zimbabwe and Harare working with uh, the Minister of Home Affairs there to bring radios into their uh, police department. Leader there, the president, uh, President Mugabe, Mugabe was not was a, a good leader, a dictator. Yep. But a gentleman, his name was Eric, he was the head of signals for the police. And I said, Eric, how can we help you? And he says, Art, here's what happens in my country. When we have elections, we are going to have demonstrations. And in those demonstrations, I'm going to have friends and family participating in those demonstrations. He says, I want to be able to control that with great communications so I don't have to use weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a gentleman in the country. He wants to treat his citizens and, and control those disturbances with great communications. I said, Eric, I will help you do that. So they bought $15 million worth of equipment through, and we financed it through the Exxon Bank in Washington. It took us two years to get the deal done. We spent a lot of time on the ground in Rari. Mm -hmm. um, they implemented that program, and about six or seven years later, they had the least violent elections in the country's history. Uh, that was an article done by the Associated Press, and it was published here in San Diego. And I took that article, gathered all the employees together, and I said, this is why we do what we do. This is our why. We want to positively impact lives, but you know what? We save lives because they were able to have the least violent elections in the country's history. Now, I think it was a year or two, they changed leaders. They have a new president. They did it in a quiet way. There was no military revolution. There was no deaths. And there's a country that's gone through cultural change because Eric Magedju in the police department wanted to change the way they responded to demonstrations. And those are the people we love to help, who want to make a change in their culture, in their country, and save lives, not attack lives. That's such a great story. I, I, I had the privilege of being in Zimbabwe myself for almost a month, and, and um, I have still something from the Mbasa tribe. And what a sweet, gentle people. And I love that story. I, I hadn't heard that one before. And I, you also got some, an example of, of Brazil, something that you did that I thought was really innovative. Tell us right. that story, because what this gets to is the heart of servant leadership, is being willing to listen to your customers, listen and ask questions to, to understand what they need and want, not what you're just trying to sell them. Yeah, so, you know, I'm going to finish up for the first, first question. The company that I went to work for was a public company. Mm -hmm. They reported quarterly or earnings. So what do you think the highest priority was in the company? Quarterly revenues and, and profit. Um, Power-driven company, not employee-driven. Um, and I worked in that environment until 2000, end of 2004 when we bought the company. But we started learning about serving people outside the United States in that first transac transaction in Zimbabwe. Now, you mentioned Brazil. If you recall, there was an Air France plane that went down in the Atlantic, and it took them about three or four days to find that plane. And the reason that was, was because the plane was in a dead zone. Nobody could communicate with the plane. High frequency, HF, is what you communicate over the horizon with okay. technology. And so we did business with the Air Force in Brazil. They're the air traffic control in the country of Brazil. And they came to us and said, we want to design and install a high-powered HF system that will allow us to communicate with any plane leaving or coming into Brazil, regardless of where it's coming in from. Um, and so we worked with them. We, we built a 10 kilowatt HF system that, you know, you've got to build a building, you've got to install big antennas. And what we did, this system runs 24 seven. And now they can communicate with uh, any plane that takes off from France or Europe. Once it gets up to about 30,000 feet in the air, they can now communicate with Brazil, if that's their ultimate destination, My goodness. before it leaves land and goes over the Atlantic. So there are no dead zones. And that was another group that said, we need a solution because we don't want this to happen again on our watch. 
I love that story because again, it just illustrates that different, that servant hearted approach to doing business, to ask your customers, your clients, what is it that's your biggest need? What's keeping you awake at night? Yeah. How can we help? And, and if maybe it's not directly that it's Daytron, maybe it's through other channels and other people that you bring together. But I've, I've long thought that one of my, many of my mentors have just told me, RJ, if you want to have the biggest impact, you need to find ways that you can connect other people up. Whether you make a dime off of the transaction, or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is the psychic income that can come from knowing that you're making a difference in the lives of other people and connecting people up. And, and I love that about the Daytron story. And you've got a whole bunch of them. Um, so let's 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 lean into more that this Daytron, the principles of servant leadership, and what have been some of the different you know, guiding principles and, and where did those come from? I know you're a man of faith. I know you're a follower of Jesus. And so one of the other questions that comes to mind for some folks is how do you be a, a such a committed follower of Jesus? And, you know, do you just go in and sing Kumbaya and hold hands with your employees? What, what do you do? <laughs> you know, things get tough and you got to knock some heads together. I mean, how do you balance the, all of that out as well? You know, they're, they're, we're human beings and we're going to make mistakes and we have emotions. Um, a lot of those emotions are coming in now with, with what we're going through with COVID-19. Um, and you have to recognize that leaders aren't perfect and people in organizations aren't pe people or aren't, aren't bad people. Um, they're going to have tough days. And in those tough days, you have to extend grace to people and forgiveness. And you have to understand what people are going through. Great example is parents today. Uh, Dr. Nick talked about it. 30% of our workforce now is working from home. A lot of our, our employees are parents. They have kids that are home. I can't expect them to work their normal hours at home because they have to take care of their children. So I may not have to have that report at 10 o'clock every morning. I may have to get it the next day because parents are going to work at night. You have to understand what people are going through in their personal life in order to help serve them in the company life. Now, our first value in our company is our families come first, period. And we believe there isn't anyone in the company who has to be here for this company to be successful. Um, that's a big mindset for mm -hmm. an owner, for a leadership team, because the real measure of implementing this type of culture is what do your people do when you're not there? Do they follow what you've taught them? Is it instilled in the culture or do they revert back? And I'll be the first one to tell you when I get under pressure, my, some of my old power behaviors come out of the closet. That's human nature. And you have to be able to forgive people and extend grace. That's difficult to do really difficult to do because along with that you have to get results you can't put it on hold now changing a culture in a company like datron that's been around since the late 70s uh took us about eight years it's not an easy process and it's you're not going to see an improvement in quarterly earnings right away but you still have to pay people you can't put it on hold now you mentioned kumbaya kumbaya but no but here's what my faith teaches me is I'm to accept all people. I don't get to pick and choose who I serve. I serve the life that's put in front of me. What does that mean in business is the only thing we required for you to work at Daytron is you have to have a heart to help people. Because if you don't have that heart to help people and put others first, you're not going to have fun. You're going to have to have to go to work in a different company. I really don't care what your beliefs are. I, if you're an atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter. I have Muslims working in the company. Um, I don't care what your identity is. It, it doesn't matter to me because what we believe is it's more important to serve the life than anything else. And we don't get to pick and choose the life that we serve. Now, we take that approach with our employees, but we also take it with our customers. Now, the only thing we, we, we differ with customers is I don't want to sell to people who want to use that equipment to just to go attack people. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a big difference. Um, if people want to protect their country and provide sovereignty for their country and security for their citizens, 
just what we do here in the United States. And we will help those people day in and day out. Uh, but if they just want to go start a war, the answer is no. We won't participate in that. Um, How do you find is, that out? Is, because sometimes, sometimes people aren't exactly going to be that disclosing that, oh, by the way, we're going to go bomb the heck out of Kuwait and uh, bring them, you know, how do you how do you determine those sorts of things? Um, we we have representative companies who uh, work are established in that country. Um, we work through them. Uh, we create a relationship of trust with the customer that takes face to face time. It takes time in country on the ground. We can be very observant of what's going on in that organization. So in Zimbabwe, we knew from reports that the Ministry of Defense was not part of the good guys. Uh, a lot of writings uh, uh, about the Ministry of Defense and what they did. So the answer to is we're not going to help that, that organization. Uh, it's a relationship trust that we build with the, the customer, and we have to travel and meet them where they are in their country. Um, now, I will tell you, we have some generals that will come visit us in Vista. And I love to have visitors because they get to see the real heart of Datron. Mm. They get to see that we're serious about the trust relationship, that we're serious about helping people. And they get to see the real heart of Datron because the heart is the people. It's not the leader. I've the been people. there and I loved my experience there. You could just feel it was palpable from the heart, from the minute the person that, that greeted me all the way to the people I got to meet in the shop and other places. It's, it is, it's a treat. So I would invite anybody to schedule a time to come up and see the Daytron World Headquarters. It's something. You know, but we, we, we have to get results. And what, we, what we've developed in our culture is we care more about how we get those results than we care about the results themselves. Mm. So how do I get there is value driven, behavior driven and it's built on relationships and trust and a servant led heart to help people. Um, if you don't care how you get results, uh, you're not going to be sustained over the years because your customers are going to see it. You, you really don't care about them. Um, and um, we all have had experiences in stores where you run into an issue and nobody wants to help you. You can't find anybody to help you. Um, they don't have a servant's um, hard to help people yeah you know, but you have to get results but it's more important how you get those results than anything else so art what's been your journey i mean you've you've had a book written about you i love the book it's called the art of servant leadership and and i i bought the book to I thought, oh great i'm gonna learning how to be a better leader is is a lifelong pursuit and then i found out it was about this remarkable gentleman named art barter <laughs> so um <clears throat> How did you start on this path and, and what have been some of your best lessons along the way and, and who'd you learn that from? You know, I, I, I started in my career, um, I worked at Disney while I went to school up in Orange County at Cal State Fullerton. And I went into the corporate world um, in the finance area. And you know, that working for Disney, they're a public company, they care about results. Um, had a lot of fun there. Uh, my best story I tell people is the day that Mickey Mouse and the band leader didn't get along uh, behind the scenes. And one day, uh, Mickey couldn't take it anymore. So he turned around and attacked the band leader on Main Street. Uh, now, that didn't reflect the culture of Disney, right? Uh, and no. of course, they had some challenges with children who saw this. Um, oh gosh. But the second I left Disney um, and went to work for a manufacturing company. And I had two gentlemen there who taught me about building products. One was a machine shop uh, gentleman who, um, his name was Bud. And the first thing he did when I went to work for him, he says, Art, I want you to come over. Uh, he, he had a building across the street. I want you to come over and live in my operation for three months. And I said, Bud, why do you want me to do that? And he says, it's simple. He says, the last person in your position you're going to write a monthly report that goes to our president. He says, I want you to be able to talk about what really goes on in my organization rather than you think you know what it is. And I spend three hours a month explaining to the president that you really don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. Now, 
that was self-serving, but he took me under his wing because he was tired of telling his boss that people in, in finance didn't know what they were talking about. He taught me to love to build things. And then there was a head of um, R&D who was an um, electronics uh, engineer. He took me under his wing to teach me everything he knew about building products. We built 1,200 line a minute printers, which back then they were just humongous. Um, and I learned there to, I love making products and I've been manufacturing products ever since. Uh, I went to work for uh, a different company eight or nine years later who did 20% of their business in the international marketplace. I fell in love with international business. It was very intriguing to me, export requirements, uh, et cetera. And so I was really interested in the international marketplace, still in the power model. I will tell people deep down inside, I'm a power leader. And you never get rid of all of it. Um, and so I was trained in the corporate world for over 20 years. And when I look back, I learned a lot from people who had a servant's heart, but I didn't recognize it. And so I went to work down here for a company called Sierrason. Um, and I worked for a gentleman who would help people on the floor. He was engineer. He'd come back at night, um, solve problems. He passed away about two, three years ago. And I went to his, his uh, service and I listened to people talk about him. And what I found out was he was a great servant leader. And I worked for him when I was 32, 33 years old. I wasn't ready for servant leadership at the time. So I didn't recognize that he had a great heart to serve people. I didn't catch the bug until I was in my 50s, late 40s, early 50s. And what I try and tell people, people may not be ready for your type of culture in helping people because they're gonna to come to that conclusion in their own time. And so the trick you have to do is manage those different perspectives because not everybody in your company is gonna be the same, uh, especially in the leadership uh, model. So I gave you a little bit more there, RJ. So as, you, as everybody can tell, I'm passionate and I talk a lot. So you're gonna to have to control me a little bit, RJ. <laughs> It, it, every time that I get to spend with you, Art, is just golden. Uh, I get so many good nuggets, and so thank you for that. It, and let's talk a little bit about because one of the great challenges I've seen for leaders is that they've had mentors, they've read, they've you just talked about two really influential leaders that you've had in your life, and and others. I mean, I know Ken Blanchard and Gary Ridge yeah. and others uh, from here in our wonderful community. But one of the challenges is as you continue to move up the corporate ladder or, or as an entrepreneur, it's harder and harder to find people to still challenge, to still learn from or get motivated by. How about for you? you know, who's, who are you listening to at, at this point? Who inspires you and, and why? Well, you know, uh, first, because of my faith, I'm inspired you know, by God. Um, but Ken Blanchard uh, read all his books when I was a power leader. Uh, had the opportunity to meet him in 2003. Uh, he came to speak about servant leadership at our church. And I was part of the team that met him at the back door. And so he walked in, we prayed him up. And one of the guys um, at the church that was um, on the staff, he says, did you bring any books to sell, Ken? And I remember it like it was yesterday. He looked at us and said, what do you mean, books? <laughs> and he said, I didn't come here to sell books. I came here to serve. Mm, that's now, Ken. That was the first experience I had with Ken face to face. Yep. I, I love him dearly. He's been a great friend, great mentor. I've mm -hmm. uh, got to know John Maxwell, Stephen M. R. Covey, a, um, a fascinating guy that, that uh, talks about trust. I learned first about the speed of trust from his father um, back east at a conference I attended. Uh, I have people in the community that I look up to. Uh, I belong to a CEO group that meets once a month. We set aside an entire day. And that is like a advisory board. Uh, we're meeting a little bit more. We had a Zoom meeting yesterday for two hours. And one of the CEOs, he's, his revenue is down 99.5%. Now, think about that for a minute. He's a travel agency. He, he, they booked a lot of cruises. They don't know when it's going to come back. And all he can think about is keeping his employees employed, 
99.5% decline in revenue, and he wants to keep his employees employed during that time frame. Great heart of a young man. That's a, that's a servant leader right there. Now, he inspires me, all right? He may not know it. And what I've learned over time is the people that are put in front of you, like today, I learned some things from Dr. Nick today that I'm going to pass on to my employees. Um, but there are little nuggets that come in front of you from people you don't even know that ins will inspire you because you may go through, maybe going through a challenge. And as Dr. Nick says, wow, one of the greatest things is you find out there's somebody going through the same thing and you get to exchange ideas. I get inspired by that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I try and tell people is you know your organization better than anybody else. You can't read a book, take the book in and tell your staff you're going to implement this. You need to take data points from all different sources, people you meet, people you talk to, what you read, and you need to figure out what's the best way to serve your people and influence them to grow uh, and learn. And so you, there isn't one book. Don't take my book and go and say, we're going to implement this because you you will fail because you need to meet your people where they are. You know what they need. And I don't think there's any one source that will give it to you. Ken's a data point. Maxwell's a, a data point. Stephen M. R. Covey's a data point. The CEOs that I know in town are data points. Um, employees that inspire me from their stories of, of how servant leadership has impacted their family. Those are all inspirations to me. So, um, um, you called me one day and you were heading over to my church to talk about, you know, legacy and, and help people understand what they can do to impact the lives of others. That, that call inspired me. Hmm. You probably didn't know it inspired me, but I, I, I went, Hey, this is cool. So uh, a lot of different sources, but Ken really challenged me in my leadership skills in 2003 and basically said, you need to change. Hmm. You need to be a servant leader. If you really believe what you believe, you have to be a servant leader. And he's the one that started me on this journey. And which, by the way, if you go to, um, I believe it's our, on our one disadvantage of having a for-profit and not-for-profit, I think it's on our not-for-profit, we have uh, interviews with both Ken and Margie Blanchard, his wonderful, amazing wife as well, Dr. and Dr. Blanchard's. Um, yep. So if you go to wealthlegacycenter.org, uh, you can see some of the other amazing speakers we've had, including another wonderful interview we had with Art a few years ago. <clears throat> or it may be on our for-profit, which again is wealthlegacygroup.com, and go to the video, click there. Uh, and if all else fails, um, send me an email, rj at wealthlegacygroup, and Olha, who, Olha Martinez, who's our wonderful marketing uh, manager, or my wife, Vimian, will reach out and make sure you get connected. But um, such great content and uh, such great lessons that that they're so willing to give away. I mean, Ken Blanchard is over 60 books so far and counting. Um, you know, Art, let's talk a little bit because as a business owner, one of the things that we do have to address today is how we're responding to the, the COVID-19, not mm -hmm. just now during the lockdown, but as we go forward. So how do you, you know, what's your advice for business leaders about how to be there for their team, some of the team probably that aren't doing as well uh, in coping. Uh, um, we've certainly seen that in our case that some of our team are a little bit more nervous about this than others. Um, so how, what's, what's the Detron, Detron plan? What's the counsel advice you would give to entrepreneurs about it going forward? What's it gonna look like once we get reopened? Uh, what would you say? It is going to change the business model a little bit. Um, I listen to people talk about leading in a crisis. I'm one of the individuals that believe you don't need to change your leadership in a crisis if you're doing it right before you get into it. Um, if you're communicating on a regular basis, that's what you need to be doing. So um, I think what we need to do is listen to people like Dr. Nick. Uh, when COVID first came out, there was a, a lot of information. We were trying to get through it. We had zero cases in Vista, but we said we just can't look at the data at that point and decide what to do and what not to do. So we're a critical infrastructure company. So we've been able to operate. 30% of our workforce went from the office to the home, which had some challenges. Mm -hmm. um, 
I started working at home. Um, and what I found out is Wednesday morning, every weed whacker in North County is in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Weed whackers all day long. Um, uh -huh. And one day the neighbor decided to ham uh, jackhammer uh, their driveway and take it out. And I said, I can't work. I need to go to work. I need, I got to have to get out of the house. So, uh, but what we did first was we have a, a lot of security doors that you need badges to get through. We decided that the common areas that people touch doorknobs, bars on doors, we opened all the doors inside the building and said, we're not going to let people touch those common surfaces because we're going to do away with our security and we're going to open it up. We also shut down most of the doors coming in the building and we only allowed employees to come in and out of those two doors. We clean those doors every hour. Mm. Uh, I've got two, two individuals full-time going through and cleaning the common areas every hour. So staircases, kitchens, conference rooms, etc. We don't let anybody close the door because that's a common area. Um, and the other thing we implemented was, you know, if you decide to leave the county of San Diego, you're quarantined at home for 14 days. Okay. So if someone took it, we had an employee take a trip to Arizona because their parents were struggling. And we told them, you have to work from home for 14 days. Um, so if you leave the county and we know about it, we're going to ask you to work from home for 14 days. We're not going to ask you to take PTO. We'll let you work from home. Um, and, you know, we were going to transition into an open workplace. Um, I, br I was brought up in the office cubicle arena. And I still have some six foot, seven foot cubicles in the office. I'm, I'm thankful we still have that. Because the open environment where people just have a wide open office, they're going to have to make some changes. I don't think we're going to have to make some changes because we still have cubicles. Um, so some of the business model is going to move forward and change. Some of it's going to go back to the old ways. And what's important is communicate with employees on why you're doing what you're doing. Let them know it's for their safety. Now, the other thing I will tell leaders is to be honest uh, with your people. Let them know the challenges that you're going through. And so we share stories of the different challenges people are going to. Um, to manage my time on the weekends, my dad and I love to put puzzles together. I've finished three puzzles uh -huh. during this time frame. So I take a picture of the puzzle and say, hey, this, guys, this is what I'm doing to fill my time. I'm now a real person because I'm going through the same challenges as everybody else is. Um, and that's important for leaders to say, you know what, I'm doing the same thing. Um, now, how many piece puzzles are they, Art? Thousand piece. Uh, ooh, you're, you're okay. I'm, I'm right. impressed. So, I, I've um, got 500 piece puzzles, but a thousand I haven't been brave enough to get up to there yet. But don't, you know, in our, in our world of social media, don't post pictures of you being down at the beach when you're supposed to be at home. You know, don't, don't say I'm, I'm gone to Mammoth or I've gone <laughs> to Big Bear or something and you're supposed to be home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let people know you're taking this just as serious because you're responsible for their health while they're in the building. The other thing we did right away, right away, is we locked our lobby. We have not allowed any visitors in the building for eight weeks. And so we've become Zoom crazy, just mm -hmm. like we are today. And yesterday, I think I had five Zoom meetings. Yeah. And what we're finding is we can be just as productive and in some cases more productive because we don't have the walk-in interruptions. Right. Um, so those are some of the things we've done. I'm going to take what I learned from Dr. Nick today. Uh, by tomorrow, I'll have a, um, an email that goes out to everybody and share the information I learned today um, and keep them up to date. What we told people from the start is we're going to be probably more strict than what's being required from us because we want to keep you safe. And so if we go overboard, it's because we care about you and love you and you're part of the Daytron family. Um, and that's what people need to hear today. Boy, they need that's to a great message. That you're protecting them. Yep. Yeah. Great message. So entrepreneurs out there, that's what needs to come across. And with, obviously, you've been living that out, that sincerity. And even if an entrepreneur to this point hasn't taken leadership in that way, what a great time to start. What a great time. Well, we're almost um, out of our time with you, Ari, here. So I want to just hit a couple more things. Um, 
how have you dis well first of all i'm, I'm asked two questions um there was a gentleman by the name of charlie tremendous jones was his nickname but he would arrest the audience with this thought he would start with i've never met a man or a woman who could make a good decision i've never met a man or woman who could make a good decision and when everybody's kind of looking around going where's he going with that then he would say well because oftentimes we won't know until we get to the end, looking back, whether it was a good decision or not. But he said, I've met a few rare leaders that could make a decision and make it right. They could make a decision and make it right. Have there, have there been decisions that, that you've regretted? And, and if so, um, how did you turn it around? What did, what did you do? Did you, some places, that, some stumbles, but then how did you get through it? Yeah, you know, we're always looking for new products and I've made a couple of entries in the markets that are outside the radio business and um, huge mistakes, just huge, right? Uh, and one was the drone business, the vertical takeoff and landing devices, which everybody loves to, to see. Everybody wants to have a drone. That business, what we didn't know when we entered it, is that all the customers want to have demos over and over and over again so they can play with the technology. <laughs> but nobody wanted to buy it, right? <laughs> so we were successful in some countries, some countries where we finally shut it down. We, we said mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't make this survive. Um, uh, there's a lot of decisions that I make that I'd like to have back. It usually has to do with keeping people who don't have the heart to help people, keeping them on longer than I should have. Um, mm. And I'll encourage people, if you have someone who's not fitting into your culture, it's better that you address that earlier than later because the damage that can be done to your culture, it will take you a, a long time to, to get that back in whatever organization they're leading. Um, that old slow that's, to that's hire, that's quick to fire kind of mentality is that, yeah, you, you have to have to know in your heart that you've given that person every chance to, to change. No. Um, I had one you... person I worked with for two years. Uh -huh. I should have given him six months uh, because it took me three years to build the trust back up in their organization. Um, but here's the thing about decisions. Even in the servant leadership environment, you have to make command decisions. There are times where you don't have time to get everybody together to talk about uh, all the input, you have to make command decisions. People who want to help people use that as a mentoring opportunity because after you get past uh, whatever crisis you had to make that decision in, I go back to my leaders and help them understand why I made that decision. And why do I do that? Because I want them to make that decision when I'm not around in accordance with our culture, our values, our behaviors. And the more I mentor them on why I did that and what data points I looked at, that's what's more important. Um, so I look at that, I make the decision, I come back in a couple of weeks and explain to them, here's why I made it, can we talk about it? What, what do you want to take away from this? Um, where in the power world, you just tell people what to do and don't care if they understand or not, just do it. Or I'll find somebody who will, right? I've heard that a lot of times in my career. Yeah. And Art, you've, you've also done some remarkable things in learning. A, uh, you have a process that's much more very intentional in your hiring process. So w would you talk about that a little bit? Because I think that was very, very helpful. Yeah. The number one thing that I'll leave you with is in, in that area is you have to hire for character first and then competency. You can help people learn in their area of expertise it's very difficult to change a character. And so we look for character first. And if you're interviewing for a leadership job at Daytron, what's gonna happen is we're gonna spend a lot of time interviewing. You're gonna to talk to five, anywhere between five and 10 people uh, because we're, we're looking for your servant's heart. And one of the critical things we do is we bring in an individual, start at eight, interview them all day long, and then the last person they see is they come see me about 5, 5.30. And if they're still wanting to talk about servant leadership, we know that they have a good heart. One gentleman who we were looking for a software um, manager, 
came in and his tie was ajar and hair was mussed up. And I said, man, did we not treat you well today? He says, no, <laughs> you did. And I said, so what's the problem? He says, I came in to talk about myself and all you wanted to talk about in your team was about servant leadership. I'm worn out. That was an indication of his character. We didn't hire that individual, but we had invested probably 20, 25 hours worth of interview time to find out his character wasn't right for the culture. Do not rush in and hire people because they look great from a competence standpoint. Look at their character first, especially when you're hiring leader, leaders. Um, and we're very intentional about that. Uh, first thing we do is we set up phone interviews. He, they, they have phone interviews with five different people. We ask them about leadership and nothing else. And then we get together, compare notes. If they pass that, then we go to the next stage and bring them into the organization to have face-to-face -face interviews. So, yeah, we're very intentional about that, to hire for character first and then for confidence. We've got a chat message from Renee Van Heel. She says, um, Art, we hire for character and culture and train for skills, and I learned that all from you. Oh, so that, there's that a great. big shout Thank out you. from Renee on that one. I, just, I, I was just inspired. <laughs> okay, what do I talk about earlier, right? Yeah. Yep. No, we inspire each other. So thank you, yep. Renee. Um, you know, also Mike has asked in terms of technologies, because you are a technology company, obviously. Um, as you look ahead in 2020 and 2021 and 20, um, are there any technologies that you think we're going to see that are going to advance um, more as a result of kind of what we're going through? And what's that? what's that look like and, and are there ways that companies can can implement more technology into their their operating systems right now if you will I mean, if that's right it. so what's interesting for us is we serve the international marketplace we serve countries that are not tier one com com countries so we don't serve nato we do a little business with the u.s military but it's on the edge and so you have to meet people where they are and give them the technology that they need to be successful and one of the best things we ever did is we do business in Afghanistan. And when we started doing business with the Afghan National Army, our radios were too difficult for them to use. And I met the general, he came to Vista and visited us. And I said, listen, he, he said, here's my problem, Art. He says, 80% of the people we're recruiting right now can't read or write their own language, which is Dari. He says, I have to teach them how to read and write. I have to teach them how to use a radio and I have to deploy them in the field in six months in a war zone. Now in the US, that would never happen with the brand new radio. It would be two to three years before they would even consider putting it in the field. So I asked the general and the Lieutenant Colonel who was the US advisor, I said, what do you need in a radio? They gave me five things. And I said, give me a year. And we went off and developed a handheld radio. We sell it for yes, less than a thousand dollars, which is unheard of in our business. It has the five things. I got on the plane, went into Kabul, met the general in his office, delivered the first radio to him. I said, General, we made this just for you. This is exactly what you asked for. And, you know, generals don't get emotional very often, but he, General Ali was his name. He says, you got a little teary-eyed. He says, Art, no one has ever done this for me before. Mm, wow. And you know what? We have over 40,000 of those radios in that country today because we listened to what they needed and gave them the technology that they could use. We do that in every country, Brazil, 10 kilowatt systems. We do it throughout the Middle East. We do it in Africa. We do it in Asia. We first want to know what the customer wants to accomplish because what we think, well, our technology we experience here in the United States is totally different than the technology that's over overseas. Taiwan's a great example. Window, um, Microsoft just finished supporting, I think it was Windows 10 or Windows XT. We have systems that use that operating system. How long ago was that discontinued in the United States? Years ago, but the customer is not ready to upgrade. So we would buy those computers in Taiwan to sell to the customer uh, because we couldn't get them here in the States. Nope. Um, I think Lincoln so, was president about that time, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and so you, you, you think about that. What I do know is the world is going digital. Um, so software, firmware is what's going to drive the future needs. Um, we have countries 
all over the world that want digital radios. The problem is that digital technology that's software based is more expensive. So they don't understand that until they see the price. Mm -hmm. And so there are times where we'll modify a radio to meet their requirements so we can meet their price and give them the technology they will use. If I leave the technology question, give your customers the technology they will use to be successful, not the technology you think they need. Great answer. Right. And, yeah. and, and our, to wrap it up, put a bow on this for us, you know, what, um, what's the advice? You've, you've given us such great counsel, such great advice already, but is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of advice that you would pass along that's been shared with you? Um, you know, in, in today's environment, um, last couple of years, there's a couple of us that teach servant leadership um, in the U.S. We've made the decision that we can't serve people if we're aligned with an ideology. And so we decided over a year ago that we would not contribute to any political campaign. Because if we represent and be associated with a political campaign, how, how can we serve people that don't agree with what we think? And it took us a year to get out of that and unwind that. What we learned during that time um, is we need to serve the life that's in front of it, us, not the ideology. Um, and those are the real things that uh, we want to try to get people to do. Treat everyone you come in contact with with dignity and respect. Serve that life. Meet it where it is. It doesn't matter who they are. And I'll, I can tell you stories about um, high school students who really don't know who they are and have taken their life because they can't get support. And schools won't let them have memorial memorials on the school grounds because of the social sensitivity of the issue. And I say hogwash, serve that life, serve it, because the life is more important than anything else and serve it with dignity and respect in everybody that you come in contact with. And if we do that, maybe we'll get our leaders in the political arena to start doing that as well. Right? Yeah. Bottom up. That's, a, that's great. Great way to wrap it up for us, Art. Thank you. We've been listening to Art Barter, um, who is the, the owner and the chief visionary for Daytron. Uh, extraordinary company and works in the Department of Defense world. So grateful for brilliant men like him and the team at Daytron for what they do for our country uh, and for other countries or for, uh, for other uh, companies like theirs that are, are on the front lines helping us. As the saying goes, you know, freedom isn't free. And you know, Wealth Legacy Group, whether it's on our not-for-profit side or for-profit side, that, yeah, we deal with all things of wealth and whether that's investment management or insurance or succession planning for our business clients and so forth. But the legacy is there because we are all leaving a legacy. The reality is that every single day we are making a legacy. And the question is, what kind of legacy am I leaving? What kind of legacy are you leaving? And no matter how badly I screwed up yesterday, you know what, today's a fresh new day. Art shared some extraordinary things. Maybe you, like me, have been a, a leader that um, wasn't so servant-hearted minded along the way. You know what, today's a new day, it's a fresh new day. So I encourage you to uh, listen to this recording. We'll be sending it out. Um, we'll, help, we'll be getting it out to you shortly along with the survey if you can get back to us and let us know. Um, but again, today is a fresh new day. So what's the legacy that you want to leave? If God forbid you were taken tonight, what's that legacy? And how do you live out the legacy that you want to live out?